So Andrew, you've carved out a really successful niche in what's a bit of an old world industry. Tell us about how you got started. So um, when I uh, first left school, I tried a few different things. I trained as a nurse, I got out of that and I got into photography. I did that for about 10 years. I moved to the UK. I um, worked as a medical photographer, but then I did a little bit of freelance. I was doing a freelance job and I, my job was to photograph a shoemaker. His name was Paul Harden, and we automatically got on straight away. I loved his business model and the, the product that he produced, and he kind of became an initial inspiration. And I decided at that point that I should really think about doing something that would give, have more meaning for me, but probably more meaning for other people. Sure. I came back to Australia. I went to Sydney TAFE, did a footwear certificate, learned how to make shoes. And then started my business and was fortunate enough to get a Churchill Fellowship and started my business from there. So Andrew, you've got a beautiful bespoke product in what's a mass-produced discount retail industry. How does the marketing approach differ? Um, well, it's about concentrating on developing strong relationships with our customers, but building those relationships over time. It's about product innovation, so always having something new, some new idea. And it's also about having very clear communication about what we do. So in a way, you kind of need to educate customers about bespoke because we're a mass produced world. So we do that through our website and YouTube videos and try to create something that is unique and individual, but has ingredients about our process so that when people come in, they feel justified and understand why they're paying that price. And, um, I think giving customers those reassurances, but communicating those messages clearly really helps in keeping our marketing go. Okay, what's, what are the most effective marketing channels for you? Well, I would have to say the word of mouth through our customers and the development of the relationships over time. And then, and then the website really is the kind of, it's the first protocol for most people. So it in, in a way is the face of the business and we're constantly looking at that to see how we can communicate the difference between our ready-to-wear range, our bespoke range, and the processes involved in getting bespoke, and also talking to them about our shoemaking courses and what that's about. So you say word, word of mouth is central to your marketing. Is there anything you can do to sort of kick that along and, and get, the, get the talk going? Well, yeah, newsletters really help that and also through various blogs that we communicate through. So they become our little messages on the way. And I think that's a really important thing nowadays. It used not to be, but social media is an integral part of any marketing plan. I think digital strategy now is probably one of the most important things. I mean, there was a time when you could just rely on editorials in magazines and profiles in magazines. Sure, they're great to have, but they don't have the same market spread. So I think you've got to be sprinkling along lots of little things now. You can't concentrate on one thing. And I think that's our biggest challenge, marketing. We've got to be constantly looking at what the opportunities are and then taking advantage of them. So really providing the platform for people to tell their story. That's right. But it's not just shoes that you produce. You've had a really successful uh, process diversifying your business. Can you tell us a bit about that? I think that's been the essence of the business. We have. We, have a, we do bespoke service for men and women. We produce ready-to-wear shoes. We do shoemaking courses. And we also wholesale domestically and internationally. And as I said, having our fingers in all those different pies has enabled us to stay successful. So Andrew, how do you approach pricing in this premium part of the market? Well, pricing is no, there's no mystery to pricing with us. It's a combination of the materials, the labor and profit. One way we can manage the pricing is we're not price sensitive like most products in the marketplace. So when there are fluctuations in currencies, we can change the price slightly and it doesn't really affect the, the customer because it's such a, the price is high anyway, it's not gonna make that much of a difference. That said, it's always a constant pressure and the way we try to keep on top of that is careful planning and just being meticulous about the detail in every process so we can save our time and get the best for everybody. Okay, you touched on not being price sensitive there. Obviously, the quality and craftsmanship in your product is your really strong point of differentiation. How do you keep an eye on quality control? Well, I mean, that's all about having very ordered systems in place. 
making sure every step of the way that the material is the standard we require and the labour is where we want it to be in terms of the quality. And of course, it's compounded by the fact that every pair is always different. If with the custom made, it's made specifically for the customer. But by having a protocol that makes sure that these problems are always arrested at the point where we can manage them, means that we can continue to service our customers and manage our prices most of all. And have you felt the slowdown in retail uh, where you sit in the market? Yeah, I think over the last couple of years there's definitely been a change in our business on the ready-to-wear side. The custom made has maintained itself as it always has. Um, and I think it's a very tough time out there for retailers. I mean, I don't think there's any big answers. <laughs> And Andrew, have you felt the slowdown in retail at the premium end of the market? Yeah, most definitely with the ready-to-wear range and that's been a big challenge for us. And, and um, I think what it's all about is we've got to still maintain the high quality of the materials and that's working closer with our suppliers and getting the best prices we can but still maintaining that quality. But also what we've got to try to do is deliver our, our product at a cost that, that our, our customer can afford. We're fortunate that we're not so, si so price sensitive as some cheaper products, but price is still an issue and we still want people to buy our shoes no matter what. So I think that is the core, the core issue is that management between the material, labour and profit, but getting a product that's right for the customer at the right price. That I think is, if you can build sustainability in that, that's what will keep your business going forever and ever. So being right at the top end has provided some insulation from the general slowdown in spending? Yeah, I'm very fortunate that it has. It doesn't make me immune, but it does provide a little insulation. And how do you keep a finger on input costs? Input costs is a big issue. And the biggest way we manage that is continuing good relationships with our suppliers to make sure we can get the prices right. And sometimes, and like this year was a big issue with the, the dollar fluctuation. We had to wear <laughs> some <laughs> major currency fluctuation costs. But the dollar's higher now, which is better for us. It's bad if you're a farmer, but it's better for us. So we don't lose that money and we get a bit of that money we lost. Back. Is that something you look to actively mitigate, the strength of the dollar? Yeah, I mean, that's... <laughs> If I could have it my way, I'd love parity with the US dollar constantly because we always, in, we, unfortunately, most of the goods that we use to produce our shoes are imported and they're imported with either euro or dollar value and there's not much we can do about that. What we can do is we can play with the pricing slightly. Andrew, you're in a fantastic position here in the Strand Arcade. Lots of complementary businesses, real old world feel to it. How do you make the most of that opportunity? Well, I was very fortunate in that the Strand Arcade approached me and they, they, they had a, their philosophy at the time was what we want to do is bring in handcrafted based businesses like myself and try and, and, try and bring back some of the atmosphere of the original Strand Arcade, which was a collection of craft artists. The Strand's been around since 1891. And that really appealed to me. And being here has been great because next door to me I have Ellie the bag maker He's an older man, he has a lot of experience in leather crafting and he's passed on lots of his knowledge to us and we've been able to help him too. But not only that, we have jewellers on the, on the same floor. So what it means is when people come to the Strand, they can have a full experience, whether it's footwear, jewellery, bags and clothing. And that I think is great. The fact that the Strand has bothered to curate a series of businesses and create a kind of craft hotspot in an arcade that's a unique offering, not like a Westfield. There's nothing like the Strand elsewhere in the world. That to me is kind of the distillation of what great retail is. So Andrew, you've trained with some of the best shoemakers in the world in France and Italy, and now you've flipped that around and you're exporting back to them. How have you achieved that feat? I've managed to import a lot of leather from Europe, so I'm using Italian materials. But the thing that's really made the difference is, is that they, the Europeans, the Asians and the Americans, what they love is something that is quite unique and that has elements that are unique to Australia. So whether it's the way we treat our leather and we just had a range and it was all about, the colours within the range were all about the, the, the effects of a burnt uh, bushfire landscape. So we use those colours, 
those textures, and that's something you don't see anywhere else in the world. And that's what people are really in liking about our product. It's, it's something that they haven't seen before, but they can relate to the material and the make, and um, yeah, they're just happy to see that. So you're sort of communicating the Australian culture through your brand. I think you've got to have something that is essentially unique to the culture. Th that ingredient needs to be there. And then what you do is you then mix that into the design and obviously to the market that you're trying to approach. So Andrew, you're now exporting 20% of your products overseas. How has that side of the business evolved? Um, look, I've always wanted to export my product and I decided five years ago that I would go to Paris and show my shoes. And um, I started out with a showroom. Uh, I show with other designers in that showroom. And um, my first order was with, was with a Japanese store called Lyft. And over time, my relationships with other stores has built, built up. During that time, we started working with a, a local Australian designer, menswear fashion designer called Song for the Mute. We collaborate on footwear with them and we show in the same showroom as them. So that's been really great because I've got my shoes that I sell and I, the shoes I sell with them that we also export. Was that initially quite a tough area to get into? It was because it's the risk and the time and also the money to take yourself over there and see the market. And it's just not Australia, it's the world. So everyone's showing there. And the, the real thing with, the, with, with showing overseas and in Paris is it does take time. And again, it's about building relationships. But uh, yeah, it's been exciting and I'm, I'm really glad we're doing it. And how do you maintain confidence and sort of conviction in what you're doing when you're exposed to sort of the biggest brands in the world? Well, it's just the same as being here, except it's a world stage. The great thing about being there is, in Australia, the, the, the style and, and the market that we're pegging is very, very small. But when you go overseas, it's like there's a whole suite of people in your area. So that kind of helps you because you all of a sudden realise that there's lots of people out there who like your stuff, except instead of just a very small percentage of the population. So Andrew, what are your tips for establishing a premium small business brand in a big industry like you have? I think the first thing is to have a, a really solid business plan and behind that business plan you need to have the framework of a marketing plan so that's pretty obvious they're the two they're, they're the bedrocks the foundations of the business and then I think you need to have a product that is not already serviced in the market so whether it's shoes or clothing or jewelry you have to have to produce something that is unique but is still going to have be desirable and appeal to the general public. So you've got to, if you're producing jewellery, it has to be jewellery that's fitting with the, the clothing that is available in the marketplace, or shoes or shirts or pants. I think that's important. So integration of the product, unique offer, but a very thorough business plan behind that, and I think you'll do okay. Well, it certainly worked for you, Andrew. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you.